Yeah. All right. Well, I will, here, I will introduce you because I'm not going to be talking very much anyway, so you don't need to hear me for very long. But welcome to our second Zoom schmooze of the summer. And we are very fortunate to have Donna Levine and Michael Hurwitz here to uh, share their expertise with us about end of life decision making and things to think about. Um, Donna Levine, I was going to say Donna needs no introduction, but everybody deserves an introduction. So. Um, <laughs> Donna is an attorney who practices um, in the fields of estate planning and probate. She works a lot with elder clients as well as clients with disabilities. She has been a Becky member for uh, 35 years and she has served on the Becky board for 25 years, which may be a record. I don't know. It might not be a record. It's approximately that. Yeah, yeah something like that. And um, so she's going to help us sort out some of the legal uh, and paperwork issues about thinking about end of life issues. We also have um, Michael Hurwitz, who is a doctor and he also holds a PhD. Michael, you have so many degrees from so many schools. I'm not going to spend the time to, but let me just say the guy is really well educated. <laughs> He is an assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine in the oncology department where he teaches, does research, and sees patients. Um, so he's going to help us with the, some of the medical questions that might come up. Um, I will say, I do want to, one housekeeping thing is that um, uh, people have enjoyed having a chance to talk to one another at the end of sessions. So I am not going to stay on after this session is done, but we're going to leave the Zoom um, open. So that if people want to hang out and discuss, they can do that for a while, and then I'll come back. We'll come back and turn it off later. But I know that it's a part of this is for learning things, and part of this is for getting to see and speak to one another. And so we definitely want to give people an opportunity for both. And then a few just two technical notes. One is uh, if you can keep yourself on mute during the presentation, that'll help. And secondly, if you have a question. You can either raise your hand or you can type the letter Q question in the chat box and we will call on you. Thank you. Okay, so Donna, I think you're going to start. Is that right? And I just want to say, Michael, I'm keeping it on the gallery view so I can see you. If you want to interrupt, just interrupt or raise. Yep. Yeah, okay. So um, I, we're going to ease into this death thing, I think. So <laughs> I want to talk about end of life as it begins well before you have to see Michael, I hope. <laughs> so, um, because hopefully people will do their planning early. And, um, you know, I think one of the things um, that I like to talk to people about that's not specifically medical or, or end of life is basically where, where they'd want to live if they were impaired, if they were sick. Would they want to be um, in their own home? Most people sort of reflexively say they want to be in their own home, but maybe they really don't want to be in their own home. The, th the uh, three most, I think, populated uh, places with Becky members in the area other than their own home are, are the Towers, which is modest cost and kosher, um, and certainly more than a little Jewish flavor, but integrated, very integrated. Um, Coachman Square, which is um, secular, but I think probably majority Jewish and they hold Jewish things and Whitney Center which um, it seems the Jews have discovered more recently and that's um, a place that you generally pay an entry fee to get into and whatnot so a lot depends on what you can afford but I think most people I see even in their 60s and above haven't seen most of these places unless they have parents or relatives in them and I always encourage people to go visit them and see um, what's out there and some I mean I actually trying to follow my own advice one of the big questions was if we were if we were impaired and we really needed help or widowed or whatever or when that happens would we which child would we want to be near would we want to be stay here or would we want to go to Newton where Alana works with seniors and you know it, so all of those kinds of advanced thinking are really important before you even get into legal documents um, just just being aware of what's out there um, long-term care insurance people are always asking about long-term care insurance obviously you could self-fund if you can afford it you can get on Medicaid Medicaid people 
lot of people don't realize Medicaid has wonderful home care programs in Connecticut um, where you can get 24-hour um, live-in help if you need it and the state will pay for it if, if you're broke or if you're married and arrange your assets appropriately. So anyway, so there's these kinds of educational things well before you become elderly and, and you know, seriously impaired or, or facing death is just sort of thinking about getting older. Mm -hmm. um, included in that is hospice. Um, I don't know if Michael agrees, but I actually went to a talk once um, where in general doctors are very slow to recommend hospice, way too slow. And um, Connecticut, it was uh, last at this conference, it was a few years ago, Connecticut was the second least likely state for people to get significant hospice time. So hospice is, um, you're eligible for hospice when a doctor says you're not likely to, and Michael can correct me here, but you're not likely to live more than six months. You're eligible yeah, so for- Hospice is a complex topic. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it yeah, yeah. after, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot to it, actually. Sure, right. I'm just gonna introduce some of these <clears throat> things, but um, <clears throat> you are, I mean, under the Medicare benefit, and most hopefully by the time you're facing these issues, you're, you're old enough to be Medicare eligible, but um, other insurances probably follow suit a lot. But certainly under Medicare, um, you can opt for hospice care if a doctor says you're likely not to live for more than six months and you don't want extensive treatment. Doesn't mean you can't have any treatment. My mother had radiation under hospice care because it was palliative. It, it made her more comfortable shrinking the tumor. So. What people don't know is 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 the six month rule, and um, in Connecticut, like I said, in Connecticut, I think the average length of hospice coverage was something like four or five days. Yeah, because, let me. You know, pardon. Let me go break ahead, Mike. For a moment. I'm so, criticizing so, doctors here, so go ahead. Yes, yeah, so yeah, there are other, there are probably other doctors. Here. So so hospice is, is complex because it, it's. Let's start with with sort of what it really is. Um, Hospice actually means that a hospice company or, or some hospice organization takes over the care really entirely, okay? Um, and, the, and, and I know this sounds abstruse and it sounds like this isn't what we're talking about here, but it really is. They only get a certain amount of money from insurance to do what they do. And the result of that is that they will only do things for palliation. So if you want to do anything that will prolong your life, that will not be done under hospice because all the money has to come from hospice, from this company or this organization, which only gets a certain amount of money and they have, it's, it's not a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of the first thing to sort of understand about hospice. And that's why you can get radiation if it's for palliation, but you can't get radiation mm -hmm. to live longer, okay? So that, mm -hmm. that's, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, there are two different types of hospices. There's home hospice, and there's inpatient hospice. And home hospice is a service where, again, it's what I said about, about this hospice organization covering all the costs, okay? But also, it means they have some services. They will come to your house. And a lot of people get the sense when we talk about inpatient hospice, I mean, uh, home hospice that, oh, it's great. They come to your house. They take care of you. That's not what home hospice is. What home hospice is, is you are being taken care of by whoever else is in your home. And a nurse will come out maybe an hour, once a week, a few times a week. They will also help you on the phone. They will help with various medical issues. That's what outpatient hospice is. And two hours a day of an aid, up to two hours a day of an aid. And two hours up, yeah, depending on, on, on what you need. That's right. But, but most people are not remotely getting two hours a day. I, I mean, I can tell you from experience, you're not getting a lot. Um, inpatient hospice. Is, is exactly the opposite. That's where you're going to a place and that place is taking care of you completely. Um, and again, they will only do things for palliation, but they can be great. Here's the kicker on inpatient hospice. It's not six months. Most inpatient hospices, you have to have a doctor say that you will die within two weeks. Connecticut hospice, which is in Brantford, which is sort of one of the best ones, 
used to have a six week rule, but it's getting lower and lower and lower. Were you going to say something, Reva? Oh. Uh, well, no, the Connecticut hospice is grandfathered under some old, right. older laws. And um, so, yeah, it's more, I, I always suggest to people when asked, I'm not advertising, I don't get a kickback, but I suggest when asked if they're going to opt for home hospice, that they opt for Connecticut hospice as the agency because they do do home hospice so that if and when they do need inpatient care there's right. there's a facility that they can transfer to easily that's um, right and there are many uh, of the, way, there are other organizations that will do that too right but there are but there are a lot now that are yeah without facilities or without maybe a hospital bed but not really um, that option, not you know, right. seamlessly as well. So um, uh, the other thing is, is if you're and, and I, when I was talking about getting longer hospice care, I was primarily referring to home hospice care to begin. I mean, my I always use my parents and in laws as examples because nobody's going to sue me for violating HIPAA, <laughs> aside from the fact that they're all dead. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean, my mother. Um, was on home hospice for uh, well mostly home hospice for seven months um they don't shoot you on the six month day and it was actually arthur levy who made the referral and when i i, I tell people this still when i asked uh, she had alzheimer's and then she was diagnosed with the recurrence of cancer we knew we weren't going to do a lot of treatment and i said to him can you refer her for home hospice care and he and he went like this yeah, I guess I could do that. And she got that, I mean, we had an aid with her anyway, but she got that layer of care that was just wonderful. And when she got unmanageable at home, um, they seamlessly brought her inpatient to the Bradford Hospice for the last three weeks is where she was. So, so it really, um, but, but I know Arthur went out on a limb and she did long, live longer than the six months, but it was okay, you know. Um, my parents and my in-laws all had like the longest hospice coverage. My mother-in-law had a year and a half on home hospice because I knew to ask. None of those situations were suggested by the doctors. They were all, and I tell all my clients when they're at that point where it's an option, talk to the doctor, see if the law, because doctors tend to be really shy about suggesting that there's nothing more that can be done. So anyway, so hospice, there's also, as, as Michael was saying, in addition to hospice, which is really a, um, a type of medical insurance coverage that we're talking about, there is palliative care, which is simply, uh, I don't want a lot of, you know, significant treatments done. There's do not hospitalize orders. Um, th there's all kinds of things that, you, you know, you need to, Think about it as you get sick. Go ahead. And yeah, I'll jump in for a few points. So, so one is that palliative care just means care for comfort, and and that can happen at the very beginning of of, of therapy. That can happen if you're going to live for the next thirty mm -hmm. years, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's that's sort of in parallel. That that, that doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, and there are also, as you're talking about, there there are things called can support where you can get help at home that isn't officially home hospice. And it can be transferred to home hospice as you need more, need, as you have more requirements, and then eventually inpatient hospice. Um, let me say two things about talking to your doctor about this. So, number one, I think doctors are a little bit more open to it now than they used to be. Um, mm -hmm. But number two, um, doctors don't know a lot, there's an enormous amount they don't know. Um, and they don't see you except for that half an hour every week or every two weeks or every four weeks or every eight weeks or, or who knows how long. And one of the reasons we may not be taking hospice is because we're not doing our job optimally. And that's just the sad truth. So it's always good to ask your doctor about things like this because your doctor may have just kind of missed it. All right. Um, I never miss anything because I'm perfect, but other doctors have missed things. <laughs> <laughs> right? So just be aware that aside from me, who's perfect, your doctor may make mistakes. And it's always good to remind him or her, or these days you'd say them, remind them to, do th to, to think these things through. Okay? All right. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, well, actually the remark um, talking about palliative care is all hospice care is palliative care, but all palliative care is not necessarily hospice. So um, it's a broader term. Um, so, so, so now you've thought all these things through where you want to live, whether you want to be on hospice, whether you, you know, all, all, you know, and, and hopefully you've communicated some of that at least some of it to, to family members or other decision makers or whatnot. But then you get into, okay, I better write this down. So what do you need to write down? Um, secondarily, you, you, ne you need someone to handle your finances, especially if you're opting for care that's gonna be coming out of your own pocket, you better have somebody, if you're not able to do it yourself, to write checks, that's power of attorney. And powers of attorney can be um, as, uh, as simple as you have permission to go to motor vehicles for me and as complex as you can take my house and sign it over to yourself. So th there's a lot of thinking. It can be more than one person. It could be two people acting jointly. It could be any of my four children or, you know, it could be whatever you want. Um, but, it, but it is important to have the finances in place to, to manage things when, when you're ill. Um, and, and it also, it actually could be springing, which is to say, this is only good when Dr. Hurwitz says it's needed. Most doctors, correct me if I'm wrong, don't want to get involved in the financial end of things, so it's a really bad choice to do it that way. But there's other ways you can, it's sort of like a key, and you could give it to them and say, don't barge in on me, or you could hide the key, leave it with somebody to give them if it's needed. There's all sorts of ways to activate it. I'm not really fond of writing into the document that it's only good if, because, then you go to deal with the bank teller and it's a problem. But I've done it if people want it. Um, make sure people have your digital passwords and, the, and, and information that, to get into any, and, and this is one that I've got to do myself, but to get into important documents, especially if you're paperless, um, um, because people won't be able to figure anything out. Um, and then what you really want to do is appoint a healthcare representative. Now in the old documents, I think it was prior to 2007 or 2010, somewhere like that, the old power of attorney documents, which are still valid if you did it before then, included a healthcare power. There was a list of things and one of them was a healthcare power. Um, around that time, a decade or more ago, they, they took the healthcare power out of the power of attorney document. And rightly so, said, well, the person you want to appoint to handle your financial may be totally different than the person you want to appoint uh, to handle your medical things. And so they, they made it the healthcare representative, they call it. For a while, they called it agent, then they changed it, they called it representative. So what you want to do is appoint a healthcare representative. Now, here's another area where I think they kind of screwed up because under the old power of attorney, the included power of attorney, the statute specifically said they had all powers except the power to make end of life decisions, pulling the plug basically. That was the old law. Under the new law where they have a healthcare representative, it's everything. It, you know, they have the power to sign for surgery and they have the power to tell the doctor to stop treatment. Of course, healthcare by the way is only if you're not competent to act. You, you would, you, you know, likely you're going to be there and making, you know, cut off his leg. No, don't cut off my leg. Yes, cut off his leg. So it, it doesn't happen that way. The financial power of attorney, on the other hand, could be just because you don't want to go down to the bank yourself and, you know, you want someone to act. You don't have to be incompetent. Um, but on the healthcare rep, I, I think that, yep. Um, I just, before we go, I, I want to note a question which you may want to come to at some point, which is uh, when would be an appropriate time to start divesting your assets to family members? So I just want to note that as something to get to. That's another, that's another session. I'll, I'll talk about it, but <laughs> it's another Matt, session. No. Um, but go ahead, Mike. So I just want to reiterate what Donna said, because it's incredibly important. When you give someone the power of attorney, that person has no control over you if you are with it. All right, it's the not- The healthcare power. Sorry, even the health, any of these things. Yeah, if you're awake and alert and can talk for yourself, you can still talk, no one can come in and say that things are gonna be done for you, all right? 
It's right. only you're unable to, to communicate. And that's generally the preface to the um, healthcare document, if I'm incapable, et cetera. It doesn't say that in the financial power of attorney. Um, anyway, the, the, the problem I have with the, with the appointment of healthcare rep, and again, I, I'll use my family for, for example, is that um, I would want my husband or any of my children to be able to sign for surgery, to be able to do treatments to in, enhance my life or, or save my life or any of that. If it came to an end of life decision, well, I like to tell us this, for those of you who know, who, my, who know my family, you know, Sid would just say, well, she's fine, no problem. You know? <laughs> and, and Sarah would just pull the plug out of impatience kind of and not wanting to deal with it. And Alana would just cry. And Josh would call a meeting of the doctors and interrogate them and, and, and come to a decision. Mm -hmm. And Josh, indeed, even though he lives the furthest away, he's the only one that lives far away, indeed, he, he's worked with seniors in the healthcare area. And he's actually several times had this discussion with me. So I am, I haven't signed my new one, but I'm in the process of revising my own document to say that any of the four of them can get HIPAA, I, I throw a HIPAA release in there, you know, the privacy release, and any of them can um, make decisions to enhance my life. But if it comes to a decision to terminate treatment um, or, you know, work towards end of life goals, then it should be Josh's decision. They're all very happy. I told them I was going to do that. And they're all, yeah, that's a good choice. We're going to do that. So, so think about it. And I think you can bifurcate those functions. I don't know if you ever see that, Michael, in documents where the functions are separate. Yeah. So sometimes we even do, you know, I want my neighbor to do my everyday, if you don't have a local uh, uh, family member, I want my neighbor to be able to sign for uh, medical things. But if it comes to an end of life decision, fly my you know, sister in from California or whatever. So, so you have to really think about that. The yeah, other thing, pardon, go ahead. I know we've seen that. I mean, most people are not that sophisticated to be really honest. Right, yes, they're not, seen. but now all Becky members will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I, I, I don't like at all is Connecticut's um, wimpy living will document. Um, Basically, you could say whatever you want. So when it comes to end of, when it comes to more routine life-saving or treatment decisions, whoever you've appointed is supposed to use their best judgment and do, do right what they would do. If they think you should be on this antibiotic rather than that one, you know, they're supposed to advocate for your needs. When it comes to terminating treatment, they're not supposed to advocate in, in a vacuum of their own uh, understanding of things. They're supposed to know what you would have wanted. It goes way back to Karen Ann Quinlan and some other uh, cases where um, uh, you couldn't just pull the plug unless you knew the person. And pull the plug is only an expression. It's not usually done that way. But unless you knew the person really um, wouldn't have wanted treatment in that condition. So Connecticut statute says, basically, a, uh, the living will statute. Now we're into the living will, which is really a dying will. It's not a living I don't know where they came up with that term. Do you know where they came up with that term? Anybody? No. Anyway, the the living will um, statute says that a physician will not be held liable for failing to treat somebody if, in his best medical judgment, is determined that the person's in a terminal condition, um, which is the final stage of an incurable ir or irreversible medical condition, or permanently unconscious, where he's at no time aware of himself for his environment and shows no behavioral response to the environment. And he knows that in that condition, the person wouldn't have wanted treatment. And then it goes on basically to say, one way to let the doctor know that you wouldn't want treatment in that condition is to do a document such as the following, and then it basically quotes those words. So, so there was a question from, from Eva, actually. Um, if you don't have anyone, can you turn it over to the doctor? And, and I think I think that Donna sort of answered it. I think the answer is, if you don't have anyone, make a living will to, to answer most of these things. And the second half of it is turning it over to the doctor probably isn't a great idea. 
unless you've had long conversations with your doctor about what you want. Your doctor, um, as I've said, he, they may know a lot of things, but they don't have great insight into what you want. And these aren't questions of knowledge. These are questions of your values and what you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what living, let's say, on a ventilator means to you or uh, things like that. And, and, and it's a good idea to discuss it with a doctor so that you understand what those different states could be like. But it's probably not a good idea to even think about turning it over to your doctor. Most doctors would probably say, no way. I, you know, so I, I don't know. Right. So, so occasionally when I've had a client where, you know, they were close, very close to a doctor, um, we wouldn't name the doctor the decision maker. We would say, you request that your healthcare uh, representative consult with Dr. Michael Hurwitz to, you know, or, or that kind of thing. Because, yeah, doctors don't want to be responsible. In fact, the document, the, the Connecticut document, another problem I have with the, with the commonly used Connecticut document is that it's addressed to the physician. Um, who really needs to know these things? The family or the care, caregivers, whoever it is that are making these decisions for somebody. So um, I have recommended to people for a lot of reasons that they don't, well, it depends. If you're really kind of old and out of it and maybe the living will is better than the, the the Connecticut statutory form is better than nothing at all but I, I have like dozens of, of sample documents that deal with issues that for people who want to get into that with you know dementia I mean I had the perfect case with my own mother who had Alzheimer's and, and cancer and the question of how much to treat the cancer and we did not, the children did not all agree. Now I was the decision maker because I had healthcare power of attorney, but I wanted to term, stop treating the cancer even with Medicaid, sort of common you know, tamoxifen or whatever kinds of uh, hormonal medications. And one, one brother didn't agree. Um, and so, and I, you know, I couldn't do it really. It, it was a problem. And so, um, you know, I really, uh, so that goes to appointing the right health care rep. So. Um, Donna, Donna, um, you know, many of us don't really have a whole lot of experience with the different kinds of techniques or situations. That's true. If you were to ask me, would I like to be on a ventilator or not? I have no basis. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, right. <laughs> and, and you know, yeah, that's right. And Michael, answer the medical, but I, I try and stay away from the medical and get more to the quality of life issue. Okay. And particularly, I mean, the way I think about it is if someone's not making their own decisions, they've got to be pretty impaired. Oftentimes, what I see, it, it's a dementia. So it's, it's, it, it, they're not going to get any better. The quality of life is going to be poor. I'm sure Michael sees more younger people with cancer and things like that. But, um, so I've addressed a lot of my documents to the issue of cognitive impairment. If people want to address that, if you don't, um, if you're not able to, it's hard to word it because you don't want to be too tight because you may be having a good time and, and playing ball with this kid that you don't know is your grandchild, but that doesn't mean because you don't know who he is. Huh? What I want with cognitive impairment is like, I, I really don't know. There's, you know, I, I, I right. it feels so, me to say to me, what would you like your treatment to be if you were cognitive, if you're demented? It's like, <clears throat> right. So I, I try and use very vague language to tell you the truth. Okay. okay. Um, when Josh raised the issue with me, I had to think about it and I, I haven't put it quite in writing yet. What I, what I said to him, but I thought back to, my mother and my grandmother, who both had Alzheimer's, not on my father's side. But anyway, I said, I don't want everybody remembering me in a way that would be a, an embarrassment to me now. I don't want to do some of the things that happened. I, I, if the current me would be embarrassed to be that me, mm. I, I really wouldn't want any extraordinary treatment. Now, I haven't figured out how to quite word that, but... Um, but it gives him some direction. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're giving your family some understanding, hopefully not just in writing, but talking to them about it. Uh, and, you know, the ones that can stomach it most can't, I don't think. But um, 
uh, certainly at least getting some of these thoughts in writing. Now, if you, you know, if, if the main thing is that you appoint a healthcare rep who can make the decisions. Now, what I've heard from doctors, I've done some doctor lawyer conferences, and from what Michael said, this isn't true because he's perfect, but the, the, most of the doctors say, we don't read them, we listen to the family. Yeah, no, that's right. I think that's and, right. right. Although, and so, you know, not entirely. I, you know, we, we listen to the, actually, let me, let me backtrack. So, so hold on a second. Mm -hmm. So when you're an oncologist, it's different um, because you mm -hmm. generally have much more of a relationship with your patients. I see my patients a lot. They're getting chemotherapy, especially as they get sicker, mm -hmm. more stuff mm -hmm. to do. So I'm seeing them a lot. I know them to some degree. And so I talk to the family, but assuming I know something about the patient, I don't just trust the family to make, this, to, to make decisions unless I see the document. I think most oncologists are like that um, because we've all seen where- There's some noise. Is everybody hearing it? Yeah, we just took care of it. Oh, okay. So I, th I think that that's because we've all seen how some families don't really agree with, with what the, the, the person who's sick you know, you know, wants. Um, and so we, we, you know, we, we try to listen to the family, but, but at least most oncologists I know, and, and, and I don't, I can't speak so much for other, do other doctors, but um, we're very careful to be clear about who the patient is. And the family is not the patient. I'm very clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so again, that's why these documents can be important. Um, you know, I think that, um, let, let, me, let me bring up a, a bad example. Uh, you have a child, your child, um, you tell your child, I really don't want X, Y, and Z, but you have the, you know, but you can make the choice. I understand, I understand, I understand, I understand. You talk about this when you're in excellent health, okay? Um, and then you get in a car accident um, and you have severe brain damage and you have to be on a ventilator forever. And your child, knowing that's what you don't want, can't face the idea of you dying. Is that a totally unreasonable scenario? Not at all. It's an absolutely reasonable scenario. Um, and that's, it's, a, it's not necessarily, obviously it doesn't happen that often, but these things do happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you really do have to be cognizant of, of what you want versus what your kids might want. Um, it's not the worst idea to have a document stating what you want, even if the power of attorney lies with, you know, with some family mm -hmm. member. Um, yeah, and there, there's some attorneys who, who feel like your, your appointment of healthcare document uh, should be separate from the language of your living will, which is the way the law is actually set up, and all you should give the hospital, and I'm not talking about a private doctor you've formed a relationship with, but if you've gone into the hospital, just give them the appointment of health care um, uh, document and let them talk to the person who, who can have their wishes written. I usually do a combined document because people lose them and they have trouble keeping track of two plus they will plus they so it's usually a combined document where we say these are my you know wishes about end of life and i appoint so and so to carry them out and that's um, really true uh -huh. At the time we hear oh there's a document somewhere and we can't we don't no one can find it right 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 so one of the things i do and i suggest everybody do is make multiple copies of their living will connecticut doesn't have a registry although there are some commercial registries but i'm not sure anyone would, would find that but where you can actually sort of put your living will or your health care document somewhere i encourage people put a little you know like the old emergency card in your wallet you know or, or anything well the most is a, a written document that the doctor fills out in discussion with you presumably gets paid for doing it i think too now under the current laws but anyway uh with very specific wishes about your specific condition and at what what kinds of treatments you would want and and not want and according to i, I just googled it and, and you know connecticut most m-o-l-s-t and a whole a lot of information came up and one uh and it was a question and answer thing it says why 
the MALST isn't considered an advanced directive is because the advanced directive, the, the living will, so to speak, people always ask me, well, I have a DNR, don't I? And I'll say, no, you don't have a DNR until the doctor looks at the living will and says, aha, we're in the condition. You said that if you were in this condition, you wouldn't want treatment, then the doctor can issue a DNR or that, or that is kind everyone, of thing. Is, is everyone familiar with DNR, DNI? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting some nods. Let me ask it the, the correct way. Is anyone not familiar? Do not, with DNI? Do not resuscitate. Do Raise not intubate. Yeah. So well, we have a, just a quick break in the action. Donna, question. Um, how often do you need to update the power of attorney? And if, if, if nothing changes over a 10-year period, do you need to redate it? Or if you do well, it in 1942, is it good for the rest of eternity? <laughs> it's good for the rest of eternity legally. Okay. Um, the the, the Financial power of attorney forms, by the way, for anybody who uh, did them, there a, a new version of the form came out in Connecticut just a couple of years ago. It adds a lot of important stuff uh, like digital assets and other kinds of things that weren't in the old documents. So uh, you might want to update it. But basically, they are still legally valid. You walk into a bank with it, they may say, oh, we don't take them after, you know, more than six months old or whatever, but that's not true and that's not legal. So, but, and on the healthcare document, basically the same thing, but if someone may look askance at one that was done in 1942, is this how he still feels? It was, you know, so, uh, but they're not, but they are valid. Um, I suggest, I mean, I'm about to redo mine because I've really sort of analyzed how my kids and husband would handle things and want to put other language in it. So life is always evolving, but uh, there's th reasons you might want to put it in. But anyway, why isn't a MULST considered an advanced directive? It's because it's a, med a MULST is a medical document that contains actionable medical orders that are effective immediately based on a patient's current medical condition. It's a document you do with your doctor. It's supposed to be, why I don't know how they're doing it, but widely disseminated across all medical I don't know. I guess it goes on the my chart page or something or whatever. I don't know. If it's, um, it, it obviously isn't being done too widely, at least at Yale New Haven, because I haven't okay. even heard of it except from you. Yeah, well, it was piloted in the Hartford area and then just became law around mm -hmm. here about a year ago. So it's so, new, but I think it could be very helpful question. to people who still have their marbles and are trying to really, right. so, for, for so, colleges, would be great. For me, hopefully they're way before even knowing what so let's just ask the obvious question you you mm -hmm. can upload documents to my chart so could you upload your mulst to my chart you should be I able guess to. so if you're technologically competent <laughs> in my chart for those who <laughs> or are, your living will for that matter in my chart but for those who don't know at least it is a is a system through epic which is what many many hospitals use now to it's your electronic medical record that you have access to and more and more. Is Hartford Hospital using that same system? Because they're in, they're coming into this area pretty hard. I don't know if they use Epic, but Epic's got a ton of the market. And if not, yeah. they probably have a very similar system that can do similar yeah. things. Sort so of the point is that, that you could upload it into your, or get your doctor to upload it into the medical record. So that way, any yeah. provider who looks at it will see that it's part of your record. That's right. Okay. That's right. And that's what the MULST was designed to do in Connecticut anyway. I mean, then you get these out of state um, situations where they have a different form and they haven't seen this and they've sent it to their legal department and et cetera. But, uh, you know, you can't do a document that's different for every state. So a document that's legal in Connecticut where it was drawn is legal, you know, full faith and credit clause of the constitution. It's legal everywhere. However, if you know that you spend half the year in Florida and half the year here, you may want to have a document that's more easily recognizable there and one that's more, depending if there's, if there's states where there really are differences. But um, again, I, I really encourage people to um, personalize them. There was, and you know, John, to your question of do you change them? I once said to Sid, you know, when I can't eat chocolate, pull the plug. And then, <laughs> then I developed reflux disease. You're not supposed to eat chocolate. And they said, "Cross that out, cross that out." <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, uh, but I've heard some funny living wills just to get a bit of humor. You know, like if if I've been in a uh, persistent vegetative state for ten years or more, 
would somebody please turn off the TV? <laughs> that kind of thing. I had a list of them. Anyway, so that so getting these documents in order, circulating them so that everybody can, knows where they are. I mean, I always keep one in my file, and unfortunately, I've gotten that call. Um, you know, got the call from Betsy Ratner one day. Um, on my way to services, you know, Artie's in the hospital, we need his living will, and, and you know, came back here and faxed it, uh, you know, but you, because nobody, when there's that sudden awful thing happens, where it's not a gradual deterioration, where it's, some, you know, something, a uh, sudden heart attack or whatever, nobody's going to know where it is, and nobody's going to be able to grab it, so have everybody have it, and, and that way, maybe somebody will come up with it anyway um so you want to communicate all that now i just want to um touch on well one thing i, I actually at david cooperstock and daryl's suggestion i listened i didn't have time to listen to the whole thing but dina cooperstock did um her thesis on um ritualizing end-of-life decisions and on her facebook page there's a whole, there's a video of her sort of giving her dissertation about that, that um, if you really want to uh, sort of ritualize the process or, or whatever, you could talk to Dina. Um, what I have thought of doing, and I did it sort of a little bit, is, is an ethical will. People may want to um, to pass on values, not the, not the values you're putting in your living will about how long you want to live, but the values you want your children or whoever to, um, you know, to know. And, and I once went to a workshop on it and I, um, you know, we had to do one uh, as we were sitting there. And, you know, I started it out with, you know, well, I hope I've lived in a way that you kind of get it without my having to write it down. But, you know, when I, I was forced to write things out and, you know, I put it with my will. So. I'll look at it one day, see if it still applies. But but there is that whole concept of ethical wills and passing that on. And along those same lines, I would be remiss to discuss this subject without talking about leaving a legacy um, financially. Um, and and uh, since I'm the chair of that for Becky, but um, you know, thinking about I think people who do leave something in their wills or in whatever documents pass on a certain value to to the people who, who know what you cared about so um those are important things now john i'll try and answer your question about giving away money very quickly and then we'll, um and then i'll have like one thing to talk about for a minute yeah you talk first you talk first oh, oh first you're sure yeah. um so first off rachel pointed out um that she brought I don't know if anyone's looking at the chat but that she brought documents to her doctor and it's absolutely true that you can bring your documents to the doctor and your doctor can upload them to the medical record. Okay, so that, that's easy. Um, uh, John asked a question about, he said, well, I don't really even know what intubation is so much. It probably is worth taking two to three minutes to hear about what that is, because these are things that are very common. COVID, yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. So, so there, there's something, there, 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 there are these things, there's something called DNR and something called DNI, and DNR is a do not resuscitate order and DNI is a do not intubate order. And the DNR, so, so if, if you um, are in the hospital and your heart stops, or frankly, if you're on the street and your heart stops, and there are doctors sitting around, that certainly, well, let's go back to the hospital. If you're in the hospital, doc, the doctors are obligated to try to bring you back to life. And they're obligated to do chest compressions where they, you know, they do all the things that we've all seen in the movies. Um, and, and that means doing chest compressions to try to keep the circulation going. It means putting a tube down your throat into your lungs to breathe for you um, and putting in you know, things into your veins to, to get fluids in, et cetera. Um, and, and, and not everybody wants that done, right? So, but if you don't have an order saying, I do not want that done, we are obligated by law to do it, all right? Now, what, what does that mean and what's the implication of that? Well, the implication of that is that it's, it's sort of a violent thing. When, when they do chest compressions, almost always people's ribs are broken. Um, 
the putting the tube down the throat can also be pretty harsh. Uh, it, it's not a pleasant existence um, to have the tube breathing for you. And, and, and the reason this comes up is because if you have a terminal illness, for example, if you have advanced cancer, most of the time, we recommend not to do that because the vast majority of the time that that tube that's down your throat that's helping you breathe will not be will not come out without you dying okay and you'll be on what's called a ventilator um, which breathes for you um and so people think about these issues a lot and and you could say well i i i want people to do chest compressions but if it's going to result in the breathing tube i don't want the breathing tube you can you can sort of make any choice you want um the the thing about these is it's not so simple and straightforward. Let's say you have cancer, it's, it's, it's metastatic, so it's very likely that at some point it will kill you, but you also have a horrible knee, and your cancer is gonna kill you in five years, and you don't really wanna live um, without being able to walk. The only way to get surgery on the knee is to get intubated, is to have the tube down your throat. So. What we do is you stop the DNR order for the moment and the DNI order, they do it, then they take it out and you reinstate it. None of these things are set in stone. These are choices that you make. Again, going back to sort of the main point that Donna brought up in the first place is, all of these things are in place for when you cannot make a choice, when you're unable to make a choice. But anyway, DNR and DNI orders are so important because once that happens, you can't make the choice, all right? And you may not want to go down that road, depending on either your view of the world, which is that if anything like that happens to me, even if it's something that I would get better from, I, I don't believe in, in those sort of supports. Or if, if you know that it's most likely you won't come off of the vent, so to speak. Um, so, and, and I think the other important point is, if you go into the hospital with any serious illness, you're gonna get asked. The doctor is going to walk in the room, some young person, probably not bald like me, and may not be super experienced and may not even have the greatest bedside manner. Again, not all doctors have great bedside manners. They'll say, yeah, so uh, you want to be intubated? So you should know what that means uh, <laughs> so that you, you know what they're talking about and why they're asking. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could talk about it for hours, of course. But yeah, I'll... yeah. And, and what the living will is, is really a document that says, if you're not able to talk with Michael about this, if you're in the following condition, you probably don't want to be intubated. And, and that's where I was talking about before. It, it, it's difficult to be too, to be sure. And, be, you know, and, and even more so, again, going back to the sort of dementia or el old age is the issue of like how much treat you know if you were um not having a great quality of life and now suddenly you needed surgery amputation or kidney dialysis or anything how much of that would you want it's really hard to be specific but yeah. it's more of a of a quality of life what you value um right. and and uh so that whoever's making the decision for you doesn't feel guilty. <laughs> Say, yeah, no, this is really what I mean, my mom really wanted, you know, that kind of thing. I also would be remiss, I think, to just say there is a Jewish living will. The rabbinical assembly has, I have, now John G. gave it me a copy like 20 years ago, so I don't know if it's been updated, but it, I, my feeling was by the time anyone finishes reading it, you'd be dead anyway, because it's like, it's like the Talmud, you know, it's sort of, um, but it's very nice. It can, I, I, I've had people who've taken a whole bunch of samples and put together language that expressed their own view in, 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 a, in a way that they thought would be helpful to their family or to their caregiver. So, um, so, so my Rachel asked a question actually. Um, comment more about ventilation with COVID-19. Uh, I'm not the most up on it, but the numbers at Yale were that people who are ventilated, who end up on a ventilator for COVID-19 at Yale, I think the um, the rate of survival was somewhere around 50%. And that was before we were using steroids, which we know now um, uh, can help people once they're in the unit. So my answer would be, um, there's a pretty good chance you'd come off it, even if it were 30% that you'd come off of it. I, I think most of us would, would want that. I don't know. Well, but I've had like eight clients die from COVID 
and somewhere on ventilators, but they were all elderly or other, they were, right. they were near the end anyway. Fair enough. So, you know, so it depends. It, it really well, That's one of those situations. Community. That's one of the situations where you might say, that's what this thing is for so that the person doesn't get on an, you know, on a ventilator because he wouldn't want that anyway. Wouldn't want to go through that at this stage of life. And again, as Donna pointed out, and as I'm hopefully pointing out, it's all values. We can tell you what the likelihoods of things are, but it's all what you value. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to put into um, words. One of my favorite stories is about Florence Wald, who was um, the founder of the hospice movement in, in uh, the United States. And she, she was my client, my friend. I was on a few boards with her. And, I, and when she did her living will, it's a really strong, I call it my Kevorkian document. It's, it's a very strong statement. Uh, 25 years ago, it said, you know, um, give her an extra medication, even if it enhances her death. And, you know, if she's not able to participate in a life in a manner, that would be meaningful to her. It was a very strong statement. Anyway, she did go through a rough patch and her daughter had to make decisions because there was a question. She had a urinary tract infection. Should it be treated? And if you looked at the exact language of the living will, you would say no. You know, she didn't want any treatment in that condition. And, um, but the daughter, who's a nurse, decided to treat. And um, in fact, Florence didn't completely recover. She was already, you know, 90. And, but um, so her daughter asked me about six months later to ask her mother, if anything like that happened again, what she would want. And the most amazing thing to me still was Florence, who, I mean, she was a real right to die advocate and had very strong language. And when I said to her, you know, your daughter wants to know if anything like that happened again, would, would you want treatment? She thought about it a while and then she said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's hard, you know that that that, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I want to answer uh, John's question a little bit about giving away assets, and and my answer to that: most of us are baby boomers or around that age. Where um, I don't know if there's any really young folks that came on, brave young folks. Well, we've got some youngish folks, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, we've oh I see we've got a young folk, Eva. <laughs> anyway. Um, most of us, I, I really worry, you know, about the Medicaid system for when, when we're looking for those services. Right now, I, if, if you came in and you said, you know, my husband had a stroke and I, you know, what can I do to get on Medicaid? I know exactly what to do and you can get pretty good care. Home care, nursing home care, a variety of care. What's going to happen in five, 10, or 20 years? Whether that system's going to be available, you know, uh, and, or whether it's going to be like the mental health system where, you know, you go under the bridge or they have cots set up on the green. You know, I, I really, I personally don't want to rely on that for future planning if I don't have to. But um, that being so, so you have to really think about that part of it. Okay. And that goes back to where would you want to live? Mm -hmm. um, if you'd be happy living at the towers, you probably don't need a lot of money. If you want to buy into Whitney Center, you, you know, you might need your money. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is people should know that there are very good spousal protections. That if you are married and one spouse needs care, the the other spouse doesn't need to be broke. You can rearrange your assets. There's things you're allowed to have that the, the, the so-called healthy spouse is allowed to have. And um, for example, you're allowed to have a house, so you don't have to have that, you know, dump in Westville. You can have the one on the beach in Brantford or whatever, so you can put your money into that. These are huge changes, but um, uh, but there is, again, the power of attorney becomes invaluable if it's a sudden crisis of being able to move the house into the healthy spouse's name, legal things that you're allowed to do to, to protect a spouse. If, if there isn't a spouse, if you're... Um, you know, widowed or not married, or um, you both need nursing, you know, care at the same time. Uh, there aren't a lot. I mean, you're it, you have to have enough to cover five years, basically. Th th there's very complicated rules for anyone who might have a child with a disability. 
that is one of the exceptions that you can provide for a child with a disability. No five year look back. You can provide somewhat for a child who lived with you and took care of you for two years. So there's things you're allowed to do, but basically you have to be broke before the state's gonna pay for your care. So you'd wanna give it away five years before that ever happens. When is that gonna happen? And even if you think you can rely on Medicaid to get good care. They're not paying for Coachman Square. They're not paying for Whitney Center. They're not even paying the tower's rent, but they are paying for care in the towers. So um, I, I advocate long-term care insurance for anyone who can afford it. There's different um, types now, hybrid forms that are sort of part life insurance, part annuity. I don't know if David Cooper stocks on, but you know they have bells and whistles where they'll cover long-term care as extras. It's hard to get a straight long-term care policy. I got mine when I was in my 40s, so um, it's uh, excellent coverage, but you can't, they don't sell that policy anymore that I have. I mean, it's very hard to get. But looking at really what you would want, knowing that um, uh, there are things that so often can be done at the so-called last minute to save assets and, um, you know, somebody may need to do that for you, so you better have a power of attorney. We, we have to currently do the, the otherwise engaged. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me about the kind of hybrid life and uh, yeah. type policies, uh, please feel free. Uh, it's something I know a good bit about. Right. I, it's why I, 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 I knew you did. And, and they're becoming much more popular type of long-term care insurance because people didn't like the kind, the kind I have, like car insurance. You pay every year. If you don't get sick, you wasted your money. And, and people didn't want to buy that. And um, so they've created other kinds of ways to get, to get coverage. And if you have private funds, you're likely to have a lot more options. But it's expensive if you can afford it. I hate to do this because we're there's still, I'm sure, a lot more to talk about. But it is nine o'clock, and I feel very protective of Donna's and Michael's time. Um, and since you guys have been wonderful and shared so much information and time with us, um, I want to just mention that we do have another schmooze next week. Mark Oppenheimer is going to be talking about what can we learn from Squirrel Hill. Um, he's been doing since the. And he's brought, I believe he's writing a book, and I'm sure that he has a lot to say, and it'll be very interesting. Same, same place, same time. Um, I'll try to put the link on the flyer so that it'll be easy, but it's always in happening. Just an easy way to go. If you can't, if you can't remember the link, go to this week's happenings, and it's right there. The book is almost done, by the way, so he's really thought through all this stuff a lot. I mean, he's been living with it for a year. Yeah, he's really been living it and breathing it for quite a yeah. while. So. Um, and thank you very much to both Donna and Michael. Very informative. Yes, Eva? Okay, I, I have a question. Um, Chris said that in the country, medical personnel look in the freezer for medical documents like EMTs do. Oh. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, Not in North that. Haven, where I live, um, we had the fire department come and talk to us they weren't used they were using their own system for north haven because you call the north haven fire department they knew where to look for their vial of life or whatever it's called uh so i'm not sure how many people are using it but it yeah you would put in the freezer you know your prescriptions your doctor's name etc and then you'd have this magnet on your refrigerator that says it's in there so i don't know if the towns you're in have a system for that it, it should be a national system, but uh, I, I, social I, COVID I, care, right? I, yeah. <laughs> I put check-ins. This, this is Chris, and I, uh, I do uh, medical evals over the, you know, in people's houses. Uh, and one of our questions is the, uh, do you have a uh, living will? Do you have end of life stuff? And I've talked, I did this in all of Michigan and all over New York, upper New York state. And yes, they, they every time where I go, they say, oh yeah, it's in the freezer. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. Thank you. As I said, I'm going to leave the, we'll leave the Zoom open for a while yeah. if people want to uh, talk amongst yeah. themselves. And I'm happy to answer more questions if I can. If I, you know, I'll stay on for a while. Thank you, Donna. Thanks, everybody.